place is now and it's forever ghosts of my life and we're back hello and hello this is lost futures a mark fisher podcast with steven and marlo and special guest maddie healy <laughs> yep maddie healy is our new guest uh we're gonna have hassan piker he, on he next week. has a lot of thoughts about things about uh women in particular yes <laughs> so anyway, this weird. week we're looking at postmodern antiques patience after sebald from sight and sound april 2011 you had something about sight and sound right uh, it, there's been a couple sight and sound articles in this book sight and sound is a british film magazine that is eh, known for being a little pretend they, they like they put out this like 10 greatest movies of all time list that like then makes everyone see, like, 1970s Soviet films with no words in it and shit. Well, speaking of which, we start out this essay with one of those 1970s Soviet films, Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker. Yeah, no, they make people, like, go, like, oh, I've seen Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker at, which like, is fancy cons- parties. Which is considered one of the greatest movies of all yeah. time. Mark Fisher says he saw it on uh, Channel 4 in the early 80s and was reminded of his favorite place, Suffolk. Suffolk. (laughs) It kind of reminds me of uh, the Mitchell and Webb. You know what this reminds me of? Wales. (laughs) Okay, if anybody hasn't heard this... We don't need to describe an entire Mitchell and Webb sketch in the context of this They go to Australia and... It's a joke on the name New South Wales, like, oh, wow, it's weird that it's called, like, New South Wales when it's, like, fucking Australia and nothing like Wales. Let's think about how the original explorers came up with this name, is the premise. But, yeah, anyway, everything reminds Mark Fisher of Suffolk. Well... And if you know anything about Stalker, one of the most remembered things about it is its use of landscape. It's very stark. It's a, a, a like a, a post-apocalyptic, uh, black and white kind of horrible looking place. Yeah, okay. I, have no, I don't. I don't know anything about Stalker. Well, it's come up a couple times. It's kind of famous for its landscape and its starkness. So. Okay, it's one so. of the favorite places for English people to go holiday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As he calls it. Yeah. He they, they have cliffs you can commit suicide from. <laughs> this comes up later. I didn't just come up with that. This comes up later in, in the meta chapter, we'll say. Yeah. Anyway, so... As we said, we're getting way off the fuck topic, but this is a sight and sound article, so it's a movie review. He's reviewing the movie Patience, parenthetical, after Sebald. Patience, parenthetical, after Sebald is a movie by Grant Gee, who uh, did, among other things, the Joy Division documentary we watched earlier in this book, uh, as well as this somewhat critically acclaimed, like, rock doc of Radiohead's OK Computer Tour. He did a documentary about W.G. Sebald, but specifically about the novel Rings of Saturn by W.G. Sebald. Okay, who is W.G. Sebald? W.G. Sebald is a, well, was a German fella whose father was in the Wehrmacht. His full name is Winfried George Sebald. Wonderful. And he, like, moved to England at some point and wrote some novels as an old man. And they were like, you know, they generally didn't get a lot of play until literally 2001. He writes a book called Austerlitz. Comes out. Huge fucking hit in the literary world. People are talking about Nobel Prizes. Uh, Before the year is out, the man has a heart attack and dies. And since then... It has been, at least in the context of literary circles in England that Mark Fisher was traveling in, you had a pretty quick cult of W.G. Spald rise up around specifically Austerlitz, but then they went back and looked at his other books as well. Yeah. And that's sort of the background context of this movie coming out, Mark Fisher writing this article. 
And at this time, one of his books is Rings of Saturn, which he wrote in 1995 and came out in the English version was 1998. But as Marlow alluded to, he didn't really get popular until 2001. And people started reading all his other books after that. Yeah, like, I mean, particularly after he died. But yeah, his last novel apparently blew everyone out of the water. Like, people were talking Nobel Prize for Literature. People were talking, like, greatest novel to come out all year. How would you describe his writing? I mean, we haven't Well, okay, read... neither one of us has actually read his fucking writing. But there, so but there is enough... There's some mil- excerpts, and also we both did watch, at the very least, most of, if not all, of the documentary in question. So the book in question here, Rings of Saturn, is vaguely, uh, from what we gathered, a first-person novel about an old German man living in England who is walking around Suffolk and is basically never given a name but a clear stand-in for the author. And it's one of those, like, the guy actually did walk around in Suffolk and think about stuff, and then he wrote a novel about a character who walked around in Suffolk and thought about stuff. And And apparently he had just finished a book in the context of the novel, like, that was a thing that comes up in the documentary mm. that the character had just finished a novel and is now walking around. Yeah. So thinking about things. He thinks about silkworms and other non silkworm related things. One of the things that they keep bringing up is his relationship to the Holocaust. Yeah, we're reaching a barrier of not actually having read the book, um, because seems like the Holocaust comes up in this book, and I'm not sure exactly how. <laughs> there, there's, like, a lot of English intelligentsia in a documentary, like, yes, in the Holocaust, that was really a thing. Uh, he, he, he could be in the Holocaust genre of yeah. novel, yeah, although like, he would never say it. Yeah, this... Fucking, my daddy was a Wehrmacht soldier, uh, seems to be a thematic thing that... The story I, I got was, haunts, he, was bo- he was born in 1944, mm-hmm. and he was then shown pictures and videos of the Holocaust, and it traumatized him for his entire life, Yeah, and it... Nobody could explain what happened or how it happened. I think probably just because... Yeah, it was the famous silent generation of Germany where, um, yeah, daddy doesn't talk about what he was doing 15 years ago. And Mark Fisher brings it up here. Um, We should point out really quick, Mark Fisher seemingly hates this book. Despises everything about it. Does not like the book. Kind of likes the documentary. Um, Which I it's thought... It's a very weird review for Sight and Sound, actually. I, I thought that he didn't like the documentary. I'm not sure. Until I, he got to the end. Yeah, when I he think says, he thinks the documentary's fine. But, like, he's also just weirded out because he doesn't understand why everyone loves this fucking book so much. Like, okay, to specifically say... This is a quote, like, r- right up at the beginning... Sebald offered a rather easy difficulty, an anachronistic, antiquated model of good literature, which acted as if many of the developments of the 20th century experimental fiction and popular culture had never happened. It is not hard to see why a German writer would want to blank out the middle part of the 20th century. Is one of the funniest goddamn things Mark Fisher ever wrote. Yeah, like, Mark Fisher essentially makes the argument. I really do love this argument. He's he's making the argument that this writer is writing without having, like, consumed a block of literary development because he's just blacked out, like, and is acting like none of World War II happened, so instead you have, like, a you know, 80-something year-long century, and that's not enough time to really have, like, you know, literature be up to snuff. He's basically running on, like, 1933 to 1945 never happened, so, like, we just are working in this, like, 10-year time gap. He's, like, 10 years behind us, exactly. Well, yes, but also he is the most postmodern writer, and this is something I want to talk about 
with the next section he mentions is postmodern in a literary sense has a specific meaning as opposed to the philosophy, the time period, time period. art style, architecture. Postmodern literature is like a specific kind of way of telling a story that is kind of always slanted like there's not a stable narration or like there's always yeah, kind of an indeterminacy not, yeah like what the rules are is fluid like you were going over it i mean pension vonnegut um, pension vonnegut ballard naked lunch by William yeah, I mean, even like slaughterhouse five it's like you are never quite sure what the actual reality of the scenario is other than just this reflexive trauma of the Dresden bombings right. and you know are there aliens are there not aliens did the guy make up aliens as a coping mechanism does it have nothing to do with that right and what seems to be the argument here that he's talking about the postmodern genre is that it's postmodern antiques which is to say that in this, Sebald is kind of capturing this antiqued model of quote unquote good literature, which is I mean, kind of a callback to modernism when we had like these flowery language of blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but, but like, I mean, the, but the, with, the, with an unstable narration without the character name. Yeah, I mean, you can read a bunch of Vonnegut and Pynchon and like write a story that sounds like Vonnegut and Pynchon and people will read it and go, oh, it sounds like you're trying to sound like Vonnegut and Pynchon. Like, it's that, like, line between you're just kind of doing the things that you know make the novel good. And here, here he gets into the genrefication problem, which was brought up in the thing. Yeah, brought up extremely pretentiously in the documentary. In the documentary. The writer, Robert... McFarlane has called Sebald a postmodern antiquarian, and the indeterminate status of the Rings of Saturn, is it autobiography, a novel, or a travelogue, points to a certain playfulness, but this never emerges at the level of the book's content. It was necessary for Sebald to remain po-faced in order for the antiquing to be successful. So mm -hmm. he's like playing it straight, as like high literature, but at the same time, never really picking a lane of what kind of genre it is. Is it him that's walking around? Is it a fictional version of him? And at the same time, having this like high literary voice, which you really get if you watch this documentary, how fucking over the top pretentious his vernacular is throughout. Mm -hmm which they bring up with the genrefication as well. There's just this line in the documentary where it was like, I was talking to him about uh, what he wanted. Like, I don't even know, like, was it like to list it in the, like, the, to get an ISBN listing or like to get like a... Yeah, they were asking for like, what section of a bookstore would you put this in or... Yeah, and he's like, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> which is really <laughs> fucking funny. <laughs> um, yeah. But the other aspect of the the postmodern in this is it's and Mark Fisher points this out is that the kind of decayedness and a lot of the gimmicky aspects of it or the like supposed realness of it are all contrived. He says here but the photographs, oh by the way, there's photographs on the pages that yeah, are supposed Yeah, it's a picture book. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. that's part of the postmodern yeah, is yeah, you yeah, have yeah, the yeah, visual yeah, yeah. meeting. No, I mean, it's sort of like House of Leaves, but more just like there's pictures in the book. <laughs> yeah, no, the, 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 there's more to the novel than the words. Yes. But the photographs were contrivance. Sebald would photocopy them many times until they achieved the required graininess. So like the graininess built within the... Like it's a little bit of an art book in some ways well even even that it's a it's a simulation of an art book like you have a thing that you then well i mean if, if, if using a xerox to grainify a picture is totally a thing like people been doing in like art like shit forever is like a little diy thing 
Yeah, no, I mean, that's like a thing. I mean, yeah, it's simulating poorer quality than the original, which, you know, always makes the philosophers think. So, after that, we get into the film, which we've kind of touched on a lot. And it's, again, unclear as to whether or not he likes it or dislikes it. He finds it jarring that is that it's in an event called After Sabald Place and Reenchantment. And he says it here that Sabal's novels are fucking weird if they're not enchanting. <laughs> it fits into any discussions of place and enchantment only very awkwardly. His work is more about displacement and disenchantment than their opposites. You can sort of see how he's treating it with Suffolk, like it's disenchanting of mm -hmm. the place. At least to Fisher's eye, he feels like he's not capturing Suffolk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then it gets into Guy, who, as we mentioned, did documentaries about Radiohead and Joy Division, and then moved into this and claimed that it was pretty easy to go from music to literature because he claims that NME writers would have loved to have reviewed this if it came out in the 70s. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, NME is still a magazine. They still can. Um, but if you think about it, literature is just a song with a lot of words and no music. Yeah, if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Some of them have pictures. Yeah, some of them have pictures. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the documentary, like, it did help to, like, understand the context of, like, yeah, this was, like, a fucking whiplash in the pretentious English literary world where they just discovered this adorable old man and then he died on him. Well, and that's how he says Guy found him, because Guy read Austerlitz and then... Mm. The thing I compared it to was um, Bloomsday. The modernist version of it. Yeah, yeah, but like watching the documentary and a lot of these people are very, and I mean, I guess this is, you know, placing it within the section stand of place. These people are very specifically obsessed at least in this documentary about Rings of Saturn, of literally looking at Suffolk and looking at the physical locations described in the book. Um, Which are on every page. Yeah, one woman who had this, I'm sure, extremely cool idea in the late 2000s, early 2010s of taking a novel and then looking up the names of places in uh, Google Maps and then, like, posting a map with a little pin on it. Uh, yeah, so she, like, was doing that for a lot of books, starting with Rings of Saturn, which, in her words, had a place name on nearly every page. And, like, one guy, like, literally did the walk, like, like fucking Bloomsday. Yeah, that guy got, like, heavy. <laughs> um... <laughs> But yeah, no, he, he, yeah, he did the walk and he like was complaining that it was too sunny because in the book it was like dour and like miserable. He wanted the experience that the book had. Yeah. Like, which sounds which just, miserable. Yeah, which is just like this like older guy too. Like, like these people are like really into this fucking book. It's what I'm really trying to get across well, through that, this that, documentary. That woman that you mentioned has like Google Earth up, and she's just pointing to every part of the trip as the documentary yeah, like goes the along. Suburbs of Southern England. This is not like these aren't the most interesting places in the world. Like, yeah. Anyway, and then this one guy was like, "Oh yeah, he had a picture of this church that was on this cliff in Dunwich, and um, the church is no, it's a ruins of a church, and the ruins are no longer there because the cliffs are constantly eroding into the sea, and the, the church is gone now, or the ruins are gone now. But it reminded me of my childhood, because my grandparents lived right there, and we would, like, go to the church and go to the cliffs. And then my grandmother killed herself by throwing herself off those same cliffs. And it's like, Jesus Christ, man. And if you were like me, and were half paying attention... <laughs> yeah, that, like, woke you the fuck up, where you're like, wait, what? If you're half paying attention, because they're just kind of droning along with this... Uh, yeah, the documentary itself is, like... 
black and white images of Suffolk and then literary people talking about the book. That's all the fucking documents. And sometimes they'll do pages that are turning. Yeah. And apparently... Yeah, it's like how you would think to do a basic documentary about a book. You know, if you're just like, hey, what do you think of this book? The documentary. Like, it's, it's basically that. You could do worse. Um, and I think he did all of the... Filming himself, I think Mark Fisher mentioned that. Congratulations, dude. You, like, shot some landscapes. Well, he says that, yeah, G filmed practically everything himself using a converted 16-millimeter Bolex camera. He wanted something that would produce frames that were, quote, tighter than normal, he said, as if a single character is looking. G sees Patience After Sebald as an essay film in the Rest tradition... Rest in peace, Mark Fisher. You would have loved bread tube video essays. Yeah, you would have loved YouTube. You would have loved Zero Books with Douglas Lane's channel on YouTube. <laughs> The way that uh, video essays have evolved in the last 12 years since this was written would have blown your mind. Yep. And Chris Petit, which we mentioned last week, Chris Petit's content, content. Yeah, content. He shows up and he talks over top of it. I didn't know what he said. I didn't recognize yeah, I, I his voice versus others. <laughs> but here's one thing I had a question. Did he interview or was he just one of the annoying people asking probing questions during the Q&A session after this was shown? Uh, Because he says here, but when I put it to him, G, the patience lacks the single voice that defines Petit or Kellier's essay films, G responded self-deprecatingly. He had tried to insert himself into his own films, but he'd always been dissatisfied with the results. His voice didn't sound right. His acting didn't convince. His writing wasn't strong enough. I like thinking of Mark Fisher going to this... Like, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, he was in a press junket at a festival. And he's just like, oh, 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 pick on me. And then he's like the most probing question that Mark well, Fisher... No, I mean, no, it's a... I'm picturing this as like... You, you're at a film festival, a film is shown, and then the filmmaker is sitting at a table and has a bunch of pretty pretentious, heady film critics asking him poignant questions about the film, and that's well, you know, I, why you have film festivals. I also like the idea of Mark Fisher in the screening of it just stewing about how much he hates the book. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the thing that Mark Fisher most took away from this movie is, Jesus Christ, what is wrong with everyone but me? <laughs> like, that, that is, like, there's a lot of Mark Fisher personality in this little article, because it, it really is, like, he just is, like, trying seriously hard. It reminds me of, like, when, like, like Lil Wayne's like sophomore album dropped and like everyone liked Lil Wayne all of a sudden I'm like he sounds like the worst fucking musician I've ever heard like clearly I'm right um what the fuck is wrong with everyone else um and like that does seem to be Mark Fisher's attitude where he's just like I I do not get what people see in the shit. That seems to be the undercurrent throughout most of like like yeah by the end of it as you mentioned you're like he ended up, like, trying to reread the fucking Rings of Saturn afterwards because he's just like, what the fuck are people saying? And it was like, I still don't get it. So, yeah. No, and this is the, the scene that was mentioned, we mentioned before. At Snape, some of those who had recreated, I guess Snape is the event. Mm-hmm. That he saw this at. At Snape, some of those who had recreated Sabal's walk, including G himself, confessed that they had failed Bloomsday. to... Bloomsday. Again, this is Bloomsday. That they, that they had... A, They're just doing Bloomsday for this depressed old German man. Confessed that they had failed to attain the author's lugubrious mood. The landscape turned out to be too energizing. Its sublime desolation proved to be a follow ground for gloomy psychological interiority. Yeah, I mean, doesn't that just speak to how English people are impressed with fucking anything? <laughs> They're like, oh... You know, you might not get beans on toast, but, you know, it's just the greatest thing that man's invented. <laughs> and they just, like, act like it's this, like, fucking amazing idea that they came up with. And they're like, oh, Suffolk? I mean, like, look, have you ever seen grass before? <laughs> like, 
Like the one guy, yeah, the one guy in the documentary is like, yeah, I tried to walk and like, you know, it wasn't a gloomy day and like people were pe- playing in the fountain and it's like, oh, yeah, wow, you saw a fountain. <laughs> like To kind of wrap up this essay, it ends with this indeterminacy about um, whether or not he actually took the walk, like whether or not Sebald actually took the walk. Uh, after the screening of the film, G said that it was not really necessary that Sabald had taken the walk. He meant that it was not important whether or not Sabald actually did the walk exactly as the Rings of Saturn's narrator described it in one go. That the novel could have been based on a number of different walks which took place over a longer period of time. And then Mark Fisher... Fucking fascinating. Mark Fisher makes <laughs> this really cutting statement. But I couldn't help but hear G's remark... In, the, in, a, in a different way, that it was not necessary for Sabal to have taken the walk at all, that far from being a close engagement with, with the Suffolk terrain, the rings of Saturn could have been written had Sabal never stepped foot in Suffolk. Yeah, no, this is what happens when you <laughs> insult the <laughs> county that an English person <laughs> happens to be born in, and you're like, well, your entire fucking country is the size of New Jersey. Like, who who cares about regionalism? I, unless you're from New Jersey. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, you fucking talking about Jersey, dude? And by which I mean the island <laughs> all in the channel between <laughs> England and well, France. I just love that this fucking walk is the light of people's lives. Like, it really did seem to be a project that a number of different yeah, they, intelligent like, literally people... literally, in the decade, this guy died, and then they all decided to, like, do a Bloomsday for him. And then they made a movie about it. Yeah, but Bloomsday <laughs> is fucking cool. Sure, I guess. I mean, you know, you at least walk around and have a pretty interesting novel to read. Ulysses yeah. is an interesting novel to read. Yeah, I mean, and you got, like, fucking toast and onions or whatever the fuck he ate and shit. Yeah. yeah. You get some liver, you throw it on, you talk about when his wife is going to cheat on him. Mm-hmm. Your best friend kills your donkey. Yeah, exactly. All of the Irish things. <laughs> <laughs> he then finishes this up with, like, he says that lots of people do this with this kind of cult of personality around a certain literary figure and he talks about thomas hardy in wessex brontes with yorkshire and richard skelton with lancashire moorlands and sebald used suffolk as a kind of rorschach blot a trigger for associated processes that take flight from the landscape rather than take root in it it goes back to the stain of place again Mm. like Everything is related to how the place becomes this interior versus an exterior, interior psychological thing versus an exterior of the philosophy of the world around us. And this interiority is going to come up in next week's episode about Christopher Nolan's Inception. What if the crime is inside your mind? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, <laughs> what would that be as a place? Because <laughs> Anyway, the, yeah. but yeah, we're okay. doing Inception next week, which is like more, you know, exciting than this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. but uh, <laughs> true to Mark Fisher's way of writing, he finished this with, at the same time, G's quietly powerful film caused me to doubt my own skepticism, right. sending yeah, me back to saying. Sebald's novels in search of what others had seen, but which had so far eluded me. Yeah, no, he was desperately trying to figure out what the fuck people were talking about. <laughs> like, he, he had no, like, he was just shocked that people liked this bullshit. Did not understand it at all. <laughs> Which, you know... You seem to appreciate. Like, yeah, you seem no, to it's appreciate. The, it's the most I've related to Mark Fisher about anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've never really been that depressed as a person, but I've often felt like more people should just 
stop lying to themselves and agree with my tastes. <laughs> well, next week is going to be a banger, so get get ready for everyone, everyone's favorite movie. Bah! All right. Yeah, that's it. See ya. <laughs>